Okay, the quantum model of the atom. This is the current model of the atom. Before we can understand that model, we need to think um, about particles and waves. So particles would be substances that are familiar to you, like a basketball or an apple falling from the tree or a billiard ball on a pool table. These objects have mass and momentum due to the speed that they're moving at. Waves, on the other hand, maybe think of waves in the ocean um, waves have, or electromagnetic radiation that you learned about in optics in grade 10. Uh, waves have a wavelength, which I've indicated here in uh, red here. So it's the distance from this point in the curve to this point. So I have essentially three wavelengths drawn moving along here. These waves have a certain energy and a frequency associated with them. So wavelength, energy, and frequency are properties of waves. Now, moving on to this next little schematic here, light was originally always thought of as a wave, and Einstein suggested through experimentation that light could actually be thought of as a particle. He called these particles of light photons. So that was pretty radical thinking, light that had always been thought of as a wave to actually have particle-like properties. Well, de Broglie then, Louis de Broglie, a French chemist, hypothesized that if matter is always thought of as a particle, perhaps matter also has wave-like properties. And so this is de Broglie's big contribution to the development of the atom, that matter has wave-like properties. So in particular, the electron behaves as a standing wave. Now we'll do an activity with slinkies in class, and I have a standing wave generator link for you on the notebook in order for you to understand the concept of a standing wave. So explanation of a standing wave will come further as we play with the slinky and as you check out the generator. Now, Erwin Schrodinger came along after that and wrote the wave equation, which really is a mathematical model of the atom. So his wave equation, as you can see here, led to a mathematical, dis mathematical description of what we call orbitals, which is called a probability distribution, which then leads us through the mathematics of this to an electron density plot, which is really just a 3D picture of the orbitals. So the math of this is quite advanced. It's explored in third and fourth year chemistry programs um, at university. So for us, it's enough to know that Schrodinger wrote the wave equation and that that wave equation produced a mathematical description of orbitals, which we can view in three dimensions. So what is an orbital then? Well, it's a region in space around the nucleus where an electron is highly likely to be found. Now, why do I say highly likely? Because Schrodinger's wave equation produces a probability distribution. There isn't 100% certainty. We're basically looking at a prediction of where the electron could be found at any moment in time, and we're about 90% certain that it is there. So you're responsible to know the shapes of S and P orbitals. So you see that I've drawn a three-dimensional axis here, X, Y, and Z. The S orbitals are spherical orbitals. So I'm trying to draw a sphere here, sort of suggesting, suggesting three dimensions. So not a circle, but a sphere. Okay, now if, if we label, it's possible for these spheres to be smaller or larger, like reach further from the nucleus. So this is an S orbital, and in particular, I'm going to call it the 1S orbital. If I were to draw a larger sphere, so one that reaches further from the nucleus, then I would indicate that this is the 2s orbital. Now, the other shape that you're responsible for are the p orbitals. p orbitals orient themselves along each of the axes in a dumbbell shape. And so they are double lobed. As you can see, this is the p x orbital oriented along the x-axis. If we orient that dumbbell shape along the y-axis, this is known then as the py axis, py orbital. The pz orbital orients along, these are meant to be the same shape identically here. So there's our pz orbital. 
And so we continue now to imagine all of these orbitals overlaid on the same set of axes. So the idea is that the nucleus would be at the origin here, there would be the nucleus, and the electrons would be found in orbitals. So there's perhaps the 1s, and then I'll build out the 2s, a larger sphere. You'll notice now it just looks like circles because I'm not indicating the three dimensions, but they are spherical. And then we can build in the 2px, the 2py, and the 2pz. And you start to see the superimposition of these different orbital shapes. And the idea is the electrons are at the nucleus here, and the electrons are highly likely to be found in the orbitals. So the last person we look at with respect to the quantum model is Heisenberg. And Werner Heisenberg showed that it was impossible to know both the speed and position of an electron in an atom at the same time. This is known as the Heisenberg, I just noticed I have a spelling mistake there, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So imagine you are in a dark alley and you look behind a building and you're trying to see the color of the car that's parked there. You pull out a flashlight, shine it on the car, and you can see that it's a red car. Okay, so experimentally, in order to know the speed and position, the location of an electron, we need to be able to see the electron. But the analogy would be like trying to see that car in the alley, except the only way you have to see it is by setting off an explosion. And the explosion is so powerful that in the act of the explosion, it moves the car. And so you can't locate the car to see the color of it because the explosion caused the car to move. And that's what happens when we try to see electrons. The energy of the wave that we're trying to see them with causes them to move, and therefore we can't pinpoint them. And so this leads to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So to summarize, the modern view of the atom, which the current model is known as the quantum model of the atom, believes then that the atom is mostly empty space coming from Rutherford, that the nucleus contains protons and neutrons, and that's where most of the mass of the atom is found and that the electron cloud, essentially a region in space around the nucleus, is sh in, in the shapes of these superimposed orbitals, and that's where an electron is likely, not certainly, but highly likely to be found. So you'll find the videos that I've posted from the TED-Ed lessons to touch on different aspects of uh, the quantum model, and they just may help you grasp this very abstract concept. Okay, I'll take your questions in class.